Hello, everybody, and welcome to OKCoin Live. Alex and I from the OKCoin listing team are here today with Dominic Williams, who is the founder and the chief technical officer for the Definity Foundation. Uh, we're here to talk about Definity, ICP, and what's happening in the market. So, Dom, we're really excited to have you here today. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for having me. I, I must give credit to my CTO. I'm actually chief scientist. Uh, we've got a CTO, Jan Kamenich, who's a famous cryptographer, and he runs, run, has the difficult job of running everything. I just have the nice title and sort of hang around, odding, ad adding the odd comment from the sidelines. Amazing. So, Dom, the, you know, thank you for that. But you know, we want to start off by talking very, very quickly about what's happening in the market. You've been around the block. You've seen FTX very closely, as well as you know, competitive platforms like Solana. Um, do you have any thoughts you'd want to share about what's happened recently? You know, I, I, I mean, in some ways, um, in some ways, this is all new. In some ways, this is history repeating itself. Um, you know, crypto and centralized finance don't have a good track record. Um, I, I don't trade crypto anymore, but you know, I've been around long enough to have lost money on Mt. Gox um, and on Bitfinex. So, um, for me, you know, exchanges going wrong is um, nothing new, and and um, sometimes, for whatever reason, they seem to um, attract uh, colorful characters. Um, and the good thing about uh, What's happened is it's demonstrated the resilience of DeFi, um, because with all of this market volatility, um, De DeFi has kept on functioning. So I, I think that's a, a resounding endorsement, um, really. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, there's there's more to the story as well. It's not just about um, it, it's not just about Sam and, and his dishonesty. Um, using customer assets for his hedge fund. There's much more to it. And it's about the kind of um, ponzonomics of an industry in general and, and the way that things are, are marketed to uh, journalists, retail investors, institutional investors, and Web2 devs looking in. And um, there's a lot of kind of like, hyponomics as well as po ponzonomics, right? That's used to suck people in. Um, there's market manipulation. Um, there's manipulation of the legal system. Um, there's manipulation of the press. I mean, you'll never hear the crypto press talking about the internet computer, even though it's got the largest developer ecosystem now. Um, and, you know, it, it's to finish his long run, the largest R&D operation in, in, in blockchain. I mean, there's a reason, um, you know, the crypto press never talks about the internet computer, right? Because it's partly pay to play and it partly represents the vested interests of its owners, right? So, you know, Barry Silver um, owns Coindesk and, and um, you know, he's widely invested in blockchain. Um, Decrypt um, is owned by Consensus and it really wants to promote Ethereum and so on. So, you know, if you actually sort of ask around, you know, not many people are aware of these basic dynamics. And um, Solana really is the poster child for how you can sort of create a kind of um, hype-based feedback loop. So, you know, um, obviously we all, we all know that uh, Sam Bankman-Fried took large positions in the Solana ecosystem as long as goes 2021. Um, he was joined by jump trading and so on. And they um, <laughs> took money. Sometimes it's, it turns out now, you know, cust, cust, customer assets for FTX and plowed it um, on a massive scale into the Solana ecosystem. You know, pretty much any team of devs could rock up at FTX Ventures or Solana Foundation or whatever it was and, and, and walk away with a pretty big check. Um, so long as they agreed to build on Solana, of course. And um, that sucked in, you know, a lot of VCs who, who felt, you know, all of a sudden this Solana ecosystem was the real deal. And, um, you know, it, it, it's very difficult for, you know, people who don't know the background of the industry and on on the inside to understand what's happening. They just see all these announcements coming out about investments in um, companies or projects building on Solana, right? Um, 
They see huge TVL, you know, total value locked figures, which we all know now were manipulated. Um, they hear, uh, you know, about all these like partnerships that are happening and they hear about Sam Bankman Freed's might and, and how much money's flowing in and so on and so forth. And, you know, that itself kind of like drives this sort of hype cycle and, and, and um, it becomes very difficult for people to see what's really going on in blockchain. Um, now, meanwhile, of course, uh, a lot of these uh, blockchains that are being sort of promoted um, as Web3 blockchains aren't fit for purpose. And, you know, we at the Definitive Foundation, which is a not-for-profit, have done surveys to try and understand um, how people interpret key phrases like, you know, built on Solana, built on Avalanche. And the shocking thing we discovered is that, you know, more than 99% of people, uh, and, and by whom I include, you know, crypto journalists, mainstream journalists, retail investors, institutional investors, and Web2 investors looking in, sorry, Web2 developers looking in, um, understand built on to mean that they, these blockchains are, are really um, acting as end-to-end -end, um, decentralized compute platforms, world computers, um, which would really be something very special, of course, when in fact, you know, they're more like digital calculators. And, and you know, all of the data, all of the processing, the web experience, all lives typically on Amazon Web Services. And only, you know, some tokens and some NFTs, which themselves just reference content on the cloud, live on the blockchain. And, you know, we've done surveys and it's extraordinary. Nobody understands that this is just sophisticated, misleading advertising. There's no such thing as built on Solana or built on Avalanche or even built on Ethereum, you know, with, with the exception of some DeFi. It, you know, if you're talking about Web3, um, you know, metaverse projects, games projects, social media projects, you know, this means something else entirely. You know, built on the blockchain is very misleading. It's built on Amazon Web Services. And that's where all the data lives. That's where all the computation lives. That's where the user experience is coming from. And, and you know, there are just a few uh, tokens and NFTs that themselves are just links back to the cloud on the blockchain. And so people don't, you know, really understand what they're getting involved in. And we tried, you know, to try and, um, we, we, we try and sample people's understanding by asking a basic question. And that is, how much does it cost to store a simple phone photo on the blockchain? So how much does it cost to store it on, you know, Ethereum, Solana, Internet Computer, for example? And, um, you know, people say, well, you know, Ethereum probably costs you $2 to store a phone photo on Ethereum. How about Solana? Well, that's more efficient, right? That's the fastest blockchain with the most transactions. We're probably, you know, um, $1, right? Internet computer, well, probably, I mean, you probably $1. Maybe you're trying to be as good as Solana. So the difference is just boggle people's brains. I mean, the, the price on uh, 22nd of September this year, I mean, in the case of these chains, it varies by the price of the token, but... Um, it cost $240,000 to store a photo on Ethereum. $240,000. It's actually technically impossible in practice. Um, and it would That's cost you $400, yeah, $400 on Solana. And again, it's pretty much technically um, impossible in practice. And, and on the internet, how, do you, how do you calculate that, Dom? Well, so on, on, on Ethereum, you just have gas costs. Um, so on Ethereum... Um, <coughs> Uh, you, you know, you, you've got to pay for all the data you write to the chain. And once you've paid once, it's there forever. Um, on Solana, you actually pay, you have to pay rent, effectively, you keep, keep stuff there. And um, you just look at the, you know, the number of sol it costs to keep a gigabyte of uh, data on the blockchain for a year, and then multiply it by the sol price, and obviously divide by the size of... Uh, To, to give you the, yeah. you know, to, to, to bring the, the gigabyte cost down to 3.3 megabyte cost. And on the internet computer, um, you, you, it's also you have to you know, keep fueling it with these things called cycles to keep it there. It's like 1.6 cents a year. And these, the magnitude of these numbers um, are just beyond um, people's comprehension. And you give them the numbers and they think you're making it up. Um, such is the disparity between what people believe 
is happening in blockchain and what is actually happening in blockchain. Um, I, I would go as far as saying that, you know, the, the blockchain sort of hype machine has misled people um, in one of the most grandest, egregious ways in history. Um, you know, with the Theranos thing, we had like Theranos presenting this Edison box and saying, look, you take this little, you know, drop of blood and you put it in and it's going to give you, analyze it for you. And, and in reality, we all know that the little drop of blood was then being taken off to a, a warehouse full of Siemens, a giant Siemens machines weighing hundreds of tons each. Um, and, and the results, you know, put sent back to the box. Um, in the same way, like with Web3, uh, you know, these things are being sold, missold and misdescribed, um, falsely advertised. And, you know, the, the, the you know, 99% plus of, of people involved in crypto, whether it's crypto journalists, mainstream journalists, um, retail investors, institutional investors, Web2 developers looking in, all believe something that's completely false, that, you know, people really are building on Solana or building on Avalanche or Ethereum. Um, and they, they believe that, you know, um, something like a phone photo can be stored on these chains. When you raise these facts to developers who actually are the know, who've often been paid to build on these chains, um, they'll tell you, well, well, hey man, it's Web3, you know, you can keep the photo on IPFS. Well, by the way, IPFS is just a file access protocol. All the files still live on you know, Amazon Web Services when you look into it. But um, the point is, that's not a sufficient answer because if you want to build, you know, something like a social network on the blockchain, it's not just photos that you need to store. It's structured dynamic data from which you can create things like news feeds. So um, these platforms, you know, are completely incapable of supporting the kinds of things that are being um, the, the kind of future that's being sold to the world where, you know, everything gets fully decentralized. Um, so. Meanwhile, you know, uh, the internet computer, which no one hears anything about, right? Um, you know, that has actually the biggest team of top cryptographers in the world. I mean, bigger than Google, for example. Um, which should tell you something, right? Because what you, what you notice in blockchain is that none of these projects hire cryptographers. None of them. And this is the crypto industry. So you'd expect them all to have, all, all the layer one projects to have, you know, big teams of cryptographers, but they don't hire any. Um, we've got the biggest team of top cryptographers in the world. Um, we also have, you know, employ many world famous uh, computer scientists and, and, and engineers and so on. We run this huge R&D operation and have done for years and years. And that's why it took so long for the internet computer to launch. You know, you'd think that the crypto press wouldn't be able to stop talking about what was going to, what was, ha you know, what was being built by this not-for-profit foundation in, in, in Switzerland. Not at all. They will not mention a single thing about it. They won't talk about the fact that, you know, on the internet computer, you can um, host smart contracts that can actually process HTTP requests. So smart contracts are serving the web experience to end users. They won't talk about the fact that, um, you know, people are actually already building things like social networks on the internet computer or, or messaging systems where the smart contracts are processing chat messages including media messages. Um, I mean, it's completely game-changing. And, and um, y y you know, we're enabling um, a, a world in which everything can run on blockchain in any enterprise system, any Web3 system. Um, and of course, you know, once you can build these kind of things in an end-to-end decentralized way, run them under the control of DAOs, um, it's game-changing. And it, it makes it possible to completely reinvent um, the, the internet ecosystem, which is incredibly exciting. I mean, I, I, I was, you know, really part of the early Ethereum community and, and I heard this um, phrase world computer and it changed my life. And I just obsessively pursued this and, and spent years and years, um, you know, working on making this possible. And, you know, in, in order to do that, uh, we had to build out this huge R&D organization. Um, this, this, is, this is where, um, you know, the, the rubber hits the road. This is what, you know, this is the holy grail, right? That um, crypto needs to actually really um, make a difference. And, and yet it's not reported on. And so, you know, you asked me about like the current situation. And I think it's not just a story about um, 
Sam Bankman Freed being dishonest and, and stealing customer assets. I mean, this kind of stuff's happened several times before. I mean, Mark Coppola's did some dodgy stuff, it seems, and, uh, you know, other times um, people get hacked and lose assets, and you never really know if it's an insider or the hacker and so on. Um, look, you know, centralized exchanges and centralized systems, I mean, getting hacked is nothing new. I mean, there's been, you know, over a billion dollars stolen from centralized bridges this year. Um, what I think is different is just this kind of insane hype machine that has misadvertised technology on an absolutely colossal scale to people that would otherwise be passionate um, enthusiasts. And this has resulted in the massive misallocation of capital um, and ultimately lots of people being financially harmed in one way or another. And I think well, it's, it's not enough just to say, well, Sam's, Sam's a bad guy. He was enabled by a crypto press that's pay, pay to play. Um, yeah. He was enabled by VCs who got sucked into the whole Ponzonomics thing in which they thought there'd be a virtuous cycle that they could just keep on investing in all these companies and projects building on Solana um, without actually even questioning what that meant. So, you know, billions of dollars have been thrown out to people building on Solana um, who are now going to just, you know, build on Amazon Web Services and keep some tokens on Solana. And this is not what crypto was meant to be. It's not where it was meant to go. Um, and, you know, now we've got a bunch of Ponzi funded chains with no substantial technology, no substantial um, R&D teams behind them. Um, who are just sitting on you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of retail cash. Um, meanwhile, by the way, despite the fact that the Internet Computer Project got kind of framed, um, and I, I guess you guys, have you seen Crypto Leaks? I have Crypt not, not. Oh gosh, there's a website called CryptoLeaks.info. It's an investigative journalism site. And, you'll s and these guys get spy video and actually show uh, the world what goes on behind the scenes. And, um, you know, it's extraordinary. They revealed, um, that this law firm, Roche Freeman, was really deeply in bed with Avalanche and held hundreds of millions of dollars of AVAX tokens. And they were suing everybody in crypto. They had 25, 30 class actions going in crypto. And the reason they were doing it was to, was to create, you know, regulatory magnets, the SEC and CFTC, and, and, and um, basically to harm competitors. Um, top of the list, of course, was the Definity Foundation, who um, was going to be the recipient of a couple of class actions. Um, look, it's dirty as hell yeah, um, yeah. and I, I think that the, the you know despite all this despite the fact you know that competitors Ponzi funded chains um, and let's be honest like Avalanche guys are funded by Three Eyes Capital um, right nearby Three Eyes Capital and FTX um, Solana by FTX um, Solana etc etc right the reality is um, Despite all of these things, despite the fact that they've locked us out of the crypto press, despite the fact that they, are, are, you know, that the ICP markets were manipulated at launch, despite the fact that and crashed, despite the, the huge effort of trolling, automated trolling on social media, um, despite the, the legal actions, despite all of it, the Internet computer has now got the largest um, developer ecosystem in blockchain. It's absolutely insane. I never even thought it'd be possible myself. Um, but in the end, you know, developers are pretty smart. And, you know, once they try building on the internet computer, then they're, they're just blown away. Like, wait a second, this is what we thought blockchain should be. Um, this is a real world computer. I can actually build, um, you know, a social network on the blockchain. Um, the smart contract's gonna serve the user interface. <coughs> All the data lives in the blockchain, all the pro data processing is on the blockchain. Um, I can run it under the control of a DAO. This is what I want. And so even despite this whole craziness that's happened, we've got the, 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 the largest developer community um, by, as measured by you know, GitHub commits and GitHub repos and things like that. Um, but you know, we, we, you, know, you, you could be, a, a, you know, small teams of developers are walking into like FDX Ventures and things like that and walking out with like $2 million funding to build on Solana, right? Um, that's, you know, we haven't even given out a million dollars in grants. Like, you know, we just give out 
uh, you know, very small grants to people who wanted to get started and they've got a really good strong team and project, like $25,000 a go. And, you know, just just from that, right, we, we've got this in, incredible developer existence. The other thing is, and I tweeted about it uh, earlier today, is that despite the crypto winter, usage of the internet computer network is um, still growing it seems ever more rapidly, it's actually showing signs of going parabolic. And the reason is the internet computer is a true world computer and it provides real utility. But if you actually look at these, these other Ponzonomics chains, um, pretty much the you know, demand for the uh, network functionality cratered you know, back in May, which I think you know, tells you everything about what was really going on. It was all smoke and mirrors, all of it. You know, the TVL was smoke and mirrors. Um, the so-called growth in the developer ecosystem was, was paid. Um, and, and they were misdescribed. And they were pumped by, you know, these bot farms and water armies, uh, which is a Chinese term for, um, on, 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 on um, social media. So I, I've actually had the privilege of actually going inside one of their control centers and having a look around. And, and, and it's like I said, a community center. And essentially, like, there are people from all across the world, mainly from poor countries, who um, are given directions, you know, pump, such, pump our blockchain project leader, give, give his tweet thousands and thousands of likes, or go and say nasty things to Dominic in the replies to his tweets. And then, you know, they evaluate it and give these guys points, right? And then you can you can t exchange these points later on for the for the for the blockchain's token. That that's how this has been done. It's absolutely fucking insane. And what it, really? I say, it, yeah. D Dom, I have a, I have a question for you um, technically. So you talked a little bit about ICP and how it's different, you know, storing data on on the blockchain versus AWS. I think it's a very important point because many people do miss the fact that a lot of these chains are one fairly centralized so there's, there's always a kind of throughput versus decentralization um trade-off and then the second is that you know um whether it's really an aws or or truly it's on the blockchain can you tell us a little bit about uh uh your consensus algorithm and how you guys have structured the chain so that it's a true blockchain, if you will, versus, you know, something that's an AWS. I don't know where to start. All I'll tell you is like, you know, first of all, with respect to consensus and things like that, I mean, um, once upon a time it's remembered that actually, you know, creating you know, new blockchain consensus uh, protocols was actually quite difficult. And that's why, you know, Satoshi um, got the acclaim he did. Um, I actually spent all of 2014 almost full time just studying uh, a traditional Byzantine fault tolerant consensus and trying to repurpose it for the decentralized setting. Um, you know, it's non-trivial. You need a back, in back. You know, you need a background in theoretical computer science, all kinds of things. Um, and you know, really, it was something that was worked on over years. Um, if you want to give the internet com computer network a label, um, it's probably proof of useful work. Okay, proof of useful work. Um, it's very different. The, the network's very different to uh, other networks you see around today. I, I suppose in some ways it's, you know, harks back to the early days of Bitcoin where, you know, the miners had physical hardware that they owned and that was what was producing the chain. Um, the Internet Computer Network is hosted by uh, these things called node machines, which are standardized hardware um, that are owned by independent node providers installed in independent data centers in different geographies in different jurisdictions. And the the network is governed by a permissionless governance system called the network nervous system. It's a kind of super advanced DAO. And um, all of the updates to the network um, result from proposals that are put in. And this isn't the case. It's not like, you know, oh, you put a proposal in and everyone agrees to upgrade. Y you actually put a proposal in with the updated binary. And, and if that proposal goes through, um, it actually happens in two steps. First, you have to bless the binary and people like, you know, build the code and check the hash of the binary against the code and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, there's another proposal that actually installs that onto the node machines that host the network. And the whole network is upgraded regularly. I mean, it's happening all the time and um, it doesn't interrupt its functioning, which is a huge technical achievement. 
Um, the network can't fork, really. It's just too big to fork. Um, but that, that, that's how it, it works. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to get too technical for listeners, but you know, if, if there, there's lots of documentation on, on, on the site. You can find this. But there's basically a three-layer consensus system. Um, the bottom layer is a called threshold relay, which, is, uh, which generates random numbers using uh, BLS threshold cryptography. Um, the random numbers drive a, a, a blockchain protocol. I mean, remember the Bitcoin is actually driven by random numbers, right? The proofs of work are random numbers, which, um, you know, if you've got enough zeros in your hash, basically you're, you, the random number is selecting a block producer, right? So um, then there's a the very highly consistent um, blockchain protocol on the second layer. And on top of that, um, there's a, something called a synchronous, well, the next level is called a, a probabilistic slot consensus, which is the blockchain thing. And above that, there's a finalization layer um, referred to as a synchronous final, optimistic synchronous finalizer. And that basically um, finalizes a particular branch of the blockchain to give you deterministic finality. So once you see some, you know, on the internet computer, you don't say, oh, well, I think, you know, it's buried by X number of blocks, therefore it's final. You, you actually look for one of these finalizations. Um, the, the real engine, though, that makes all this possible is like called Chain Key Crypto, which, um, you know, the, the internet computer blockchain as a whole and its internal subnets, which are kind of combined into one blockchain. Um, very different to what you've, Avalanche is saying, so it's these standalone blockchains. The, these things actually have public keys called chain keys. And um, that's made possible through something called threshold cryptography. And the challenge actually, you know, threshold cryptography is relatively easy. The challenge is how do you create the um, key, dis, you know, distributed key material on the nodes uh, without a central controller? And then, you know, of course, blockchains have dynamic membership. There are nodes coming and going all the time. How do you, how do you maintain, keep, keep this um, chain key the same? Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty complex, but, you know, you can go onto the website and get a how it works and you can get d descriptions and you can, you know, um, drill right into the, the cryptography. I mean, I recommend anyone who really wants to get a, a flavor of what the internet computer is about, go to that internetcomputer.org website and, and drill down and actually drill down into, you know, you have to go quite far into the tree, but get to, get to some of the, like the cryptography papers, like the non-interactive DKG. The, that, the, you know, mathematics and cryptography, that's cryptography, that sophistication has not only been invented at the Definity Foundation, but actually implemented in code and is, is actually, you know, um, running in a production block, blockchain is mind blowing. It's a huge achievement to, to, to all the people who worked on it. Can I, let me just ask you a quick question here, um, a quick follow up, and then I know David has a couple. Uh, why create your own L1, if you will, and why not just build a solution on top of Bitcoin, a scaling solution on top of Bitcoin? A, scale, a scaling solution on top of what, sorry? On, Bitcoin. On, well, I mean, look, it just wouldn't work. I mean, um, you know, Bitcoin finality, I forget what it is now. I mean, it, a block is 10 minutes in expectation. And, you know, you, you're usually good off to like three or four blocks. So finality is like 40 minutes. Um, if you, you know, the internet computer is a world computer. So it does, it ha everything had to be rethought and redesigned. So, um, you know, it'll give you a finality on a smart contract computation that updates state, I, you know, leaves persistent changes to memory pages in, in, in about a second. Um, so that's obviously a lot faster than um, 30, 40 minutes. Um, it actually also has to, it also pre-finalizes some transactions. So I think I mentioned that, you know, the internet, smart contracts on the internet computer can actually serve uh, interactive web experiences. And, you know, that involves some kind of static assets that, that you know, like JavaScript files, HTML files, images, and so on. Um, and sometimes even, even those things update pretty regularly. But what it does is, you know, each small contract has like a state root and it can put all these things in like a Merkle tree internally. And then every second, that's, that state root inside the small contract, canister small contract, is being, um, you know, updated within a larger Merkle tree and signed, at, which is signed at the root by the, by the chain using its chain key. And um, so if you like, these query calls are pre-finalized transactions. And when they're served to a browser, say, um, they, 
in, in the headers there's a chain key signature and that enables a service worker to you know um, validate not only that the chain is working correctly but also that the object that's been served by the chain hasn't been tampered with um, and you can do it in lots of ways. I mean, the, the most commonly people don't even know it's happening. It's by a service worker. But if you want to get a little bit of extra security, you could do it with a plugin or a modified web browser or something. Um, and, and that, you know, makes it possible for, for the internet computer to, sign, to, to serve um, critical transactions in milliseconds. Now, of course, these things are pre-finalized, right, because the, 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 uh, it, it's predictable that they're going to be requested. Um, but you know these kinds of innovations you couldn't possibly do it with in any other way. Another example of um, the, the, you know the kind of changes, um, unlike a normal blockchain, you don't need to download the blocks and replay them with a lo you know with a local client or a local node, whatever you want to call it, and um, with which you can interact to be sure you're interacting with the blockchain. Um, you can't just download the blocks from um, the internet computer obviously be too big. I mean, the, this, this thing's designed eventually to process billions of transactions a second. Um, instead, you just use this, you know, you just validate the signatures on your interactions with it. And, and if the signatures are valid, that tells you the blockchain's working correctly, hasn't been corrupted, and also your interaction hasn't been tampered with. Now, uh, the other thing is, of course, gas. Like, you know, if, if you're interacting with, uh, you know, a Web3 service on the internet computer, um, you know, behind the scene, you know, to you it just looks like a normal website, right? A, a, you know, a normal social media website, say. Um, but actually, all of the interactions um, are kind of transactions, right? Like, you know, um, as long as it's not running on the single raw, the, 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 the objects are pre-finalized transactions and the, the browsers, um, you know, code inside the browser that you can't see is validating the stuff that's coming. And when you do something that modifies the state, like there's a thing called discover, which is kind of like, I don't know, it's like a sort of web three emerging web web three reddit right it's got 150,000 users at the moment um it's a very cool thing um you know when you post something on reddit like that post is is is, is you know it's being uh you know stored in a smart contract and you know it's put in the smart contract by a transaction um so but you know the user isn't isn't obviously be very inconvenient if the user had to get tokens to interact with discover and they had to actually like you know add the gas to every transaction, it wouldn't work at all, right? It has to look like a normal, normal, web, you know, normal experience. So um, the, the internet computer uses something called reverse gas. And this, again, another one of these features that you just don't see anywhere else in blockchain. Reverse gas basically means that instead of the user paying for the gas on transactions, the, the smart contracts pay for their own computation. So, you know, smart contracts on the internet computer are a bit like Tesla cars, right? You charge them up with cycles. And when they perform computations, they eat their way through the cycles. So it's like a Tesla car, you know, the Tesla car, you charge it with electricity, you drive it around, the electricity is depleted. And um, if you don't fill it up again with more electricity, or charge it up rather, <laughs> the Tesla will stop running. Smart contracts on the internet computer are the same. You, you, you charge them up with these things called cycles. And um, if they run out, they stop. Anyone can send more cycles to get them going again. But uh, that's called reverse gas. So, you know, when you dig into the internet computer, you um, see that, over those years and years of R&D, um, all kinds of like architectural innovations um, occurred to make, you know, make to make it possible to create a real, to make it possible to create this world computer, um, and they 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 combine with you know this huge amount of like super advanced novel um, cryptography. Um, to, to allow a network like this to run. But it's, you know, everything's different. Like, you know, even things like, um, you know, when the DAO came out in, in, when the DAO came out, the DAO in 2016, you know, in the Ethereum community, that was obviously a bit of a big disaster. Some people accused me of hacking it, and I didn't, just to get it out there. But the reason they accused <laughs> me of, yeah, the reason they accused me of hacking it is, hacking it is because I used to sort of post all the time, you know, suggesting reasons why, the, you know, the design might be insecure and problems might occur. And, um, obviously, the problems did occur, although for a slightly different reason, re-entrancy. Um, and I went on from that and, you know, basically thought about how DAOs should be designed and how they could reach decisions quickly, how certain kinds of attack could be prevented and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, that led into this post in 2017, I described this thing, the blockchain, blockchain nervous system. And that's what the network nervous system became, right? And, this is the only blockchain in the world 
that is controlled by a permissionless governance system where you know um, anyone can post proposals and if they're adopted they'll be executed automatically it's the only one I see only one which you know is adaptive and is updating itself all the time and by contrast other blockchains are updated uh, with the help of like a sort of cabal of insiders like you know so some company like you know I mean think when, when Solana is updating you're Solana Labs a for-profit company who sort of gets in touch with all the validators and um, helps them upgrade the software and fork the network I and mean, this is just not a good way of doing things obviously right but the problem with these blockchains is they're not powerful enough to support something like the network nervous system even if they wanted to and so they're sort of stuck in this kind of like um, world uh, where you have to kind of um, up update everything um, in this manual way using a sort of team of insiders. So there's so many differences and I think part, that's part of, has been one of the challenges with the Internet Computer Project generally. It's, it's like how do you, how do you bring someone up to speed because it's not, you know, like oh this is a bit faster or a bit more efficient. It's like well actually, you know, um, it's more than 20,000 times more efficient than the next blockchain. Well, then the person says, well, well that's because, well, how's that even possible, right? And it's, well, so, okay, we have this thing called, one of the ways, one of the ways it's possible, you know, deterministic decentralization. So when these, um, it, because it has a governance system, you know, when it wants to add capacity, it creates an internal subnet, which is invisible, and it forms a subnet blockchain by combining nodes from independent node providers um, that are installed in you know different data centers in different geographies in different jurisdictions and through this approach it can get the required um, security and liveness properties much more with, with much greater efficiency and obviously the execution environment and everything else is just vastly more efficient too um, and then they'll say well that doesn't sound very decentralized you know on ethereum there's uh, 458,000 validators and that makes it more secure and it's tough because that's how, you know, the industry has, has sold, you know, cloud validators that somehow having lots and lots of validators in the cloud makes these networks more secure. And, you know, you try to explain, well, it's not quite true, you know, mathematically speaking, um, it's not true at all. Um, and, you know, actually, when you have like thousands of validators in the cloud, they're not really decentralized, even if lots of different people have spun them up. Um, for example, if you look at Solana, you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Hetzner, which is a Big, the biggest German, I think it's the biggest European cloud provider um, based in Germany, Hetzner decided they didn't want blockchain on the cloud anymore and they started off by flicking a switch which switched off, turned off every single Solana validator. Like they lost, in one go, Solana lost 40% of its validators, more than a thousand. Which I think illustrates like whether really, um, whether really, you know, um, thousands of valid or a thousand plus validators on Hetzner, or was there really one validator? I would contend there was really one validator. And it's a sad truth today that, you know, these blockchain ecosystems run nearly entirely in, in the cloud and they could literally be switched off um, at, at any moment by, by the cloud operators. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that, there, I mean, if you want to go deep, it's not pleasant, but, you know, Having, you know, I can tell you this, having been in the industry for, for many years, you know, um, and really understanding how it works. One of the main purposes for this proof of stake model um, is one, to lock up stake so it's not in the market, so it's easier to support the price. And number two, um, it's a kind of pyramid marketing scheme because once you lock people in, these people who credit validators then start shilling for the network because their capital's locked up and they become, you know, rabid supporters. So um, I understand, you know, that's worked in many respects to build blockchain communities, but it doesn't, you know, that design doesn't really bear any relation to, you know, hardcore crypto and uh, its aims to, you know, for example, create a world computer that can allow the entire, you know, all of the world's services and systems to be re-engineered on a blockchain. It's but it does, it does succeed in the sense that, you know, well, I've, you, know, you can get thousands and thousands of people to um, spin up these validators on, on cloud computing services under the guise of helping secure the network um, and locking up all their capital so it's not sloshing around in the markets. So you can, you know, manipulate those markets and give them confidence 
and have them become shills and advocates for your network. But I think we've got to get past this. Like, I think, you know, blockchains got to get at, blockchains need to follow the leader definitively. Here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the real deal. So if you look at the innovations that everybody is, is adopting now, they often come from the Definity Foundation. So Definity originally was a project to create an Ethereum 2.0 or something like that, went its own way. Um, if you look at Ethereum 2.0, it's very similar to an early 2015 Definity design. Um, if you look at the widespread use of BLS cryptography, um, which Vitalik, in, in fact, was still protesting, wasn't safe until like 2017 at least, because I remember being on stage with them with the Visa Research. Um, you know, BLS cryptography, well, you know, the L from BLS cryptography is Ben Lin. He's a Definity, uh, you know, cryptographer, engineer, researcher. Um, WebAssembly, right? Everyone wants to use WebAssembly as the virtual machine for these modern blockchains. Well, that was created by a guy called Andreas Rosberg. Um, you know, another early, both Ben Lin and Andreas Rosberg, you know, were working in Affinity in 2017. So, you know, I think a lot of people publicly like to sort of poo poo, poo, -poo <laughs> uh, the internet computer technology and, and, and um, try and uh, mask what it is, um, but the reality is it's the sort of, um, it's the source of a lot of technology that a lot of projects in blockchain are already using. Um, but, but, you know, God forbid anyone found out about that, right? So I guess I have a you know, question about that. So, you know, a lot of what you said, especially early up, really kind of resonated with me, especially about kind of talking about the industry and the way that it's been set up recently with the VC money and kind of the shilling and the kind of bots and the Twitter followers and, you know, the TikTok followers. Um, I, I remember there was a time when everybody on TikTok was shilling bat girl token. Um, and, I, and I can't believe that people actually bought it and everybody was saying like bat girl token is the next, I, I, it was like Ethereum or something crazy and people were just listening because you know, to your point, there's not enough good information and at some point when everybody's saying it, people will believe it if they don't have enough access to true information. Um, so I guess, you know, I want to ask you this, I want to ask you two quick questions before we head into our last quick section of okay, not okay, which is, you know, A, like, how do you stay in the industry, you know, despite all of the way that the industry has been in the last X many years and B, you know, do you feel that the bear market and all of the you know exposes is actually good for the industry? You know, I, I would hesitate to say um, uh, what's happened is good. And I'll tell you why, you know, a, a lot of the money that retail investors have, lo have lost um, is now, <clears throat> you know, taken the form of a Lamborghini driving around in Dubai. That's the reality. Yeah. Um, and Absolutely. with a nudge and a wink, you know, crooked blockchain um, per game became predominant. Uh, you know, um, there's a guy called, um, there's a thing called Gresham's Law, named after an economist, I think, in the 1500s. And it's that bad money drives out the good. That's what happened in yeah. blockchain. It became about fast money and selling tokens to people who actually believed in, in, in crypto and, and Web3 and just weren't privy to the kind of information that I am. They didn't understand the crypto press, press's play to, um, pay to play and, and represents vested interest. They didn't understand that social media is completely manipulated. And look, I mean, you go to anything I say on, on Twitter and you'll see all these kind of like price graphs, all kinds of other crazy stuff in the replies. I mean, this isn't organic. It's actually paid for by competitors. People just didn't know. Um, they didn't know that prices on exchanges are manipulated. They didn't know that, um, you know, a lot of an announcements are manufactured specifically with the price of pumping the related tokens. It's just very difficult for the ordinary person um, to, to understand. And to the extent that this got so far away from us that, you know, as I said, you know, we, we've done these surveys in asking people what it means when something's built on Solana, built on Avalanche, but um, asking people how much does it cost to store a phone photo? And you're know, telling like, you know, $2 when it's $240,000. Um, like the difference between, and that's 99%, you know, journalists, crypto journalists, mainstream journalists, 
and retail investors, institutional investors, and Web2 developers. It, it's and like, everybody in a crypto conference. Yeah, everyone has been completely misled and sold a chimera. And that this could happen is absolutely shocking to me. Like the level of misinformation out there, the level of, um, and you, you know, I mean, I, I live with, you know, the consequences of some of the stuff that was done to, to this project. You know, people honestly believe I've got $10 billion of cash from dumping ICP and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's not, not some, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, to be honest. And I'm not gonna, I'm not though, however, gonna cry pity, and I'll tell you why. You know, millions of retail investors have lost fortunes thanks to this. And, yeah. you know, often they, they couldn't afford it. And, and my heart goes out to them and that makes me angry. And it makes me just absolutely determined one way or another to change crypto so that this can never happen again. And I think once the truth gets out by the internet computer and people actually understand what happened, you know, there's a kind of post-mortem, they'll realize that, you know, Sam Bangman free was a you know, very bad actor and he was at the heart of all of this. But, but, but this goes far further than just the, the customer assets that he stole. Um, and it's like... It's the whole system, it's right? The whole it's, system. it's the, money, it's the it's whole the system, yeah. And, yeah. and it's a shame because, you know, Web3 will change the world and it's hugely impactful and a lot of value will be created. But, uh, you know, what happened was way worse than penny stocks in the 1920s. Like, it was just terrible. And so I think... On the one hand, I'm glad that this has happened. I'm glad that some of these um, really corrupt actors and, and, and people who are at the center of all this are going to get their comeuppance. And so I think this is a necessary thing, a necessary washing out that's going to allow crypto to go forwards. But I also feel heartbroken for, um, you know, I, I feel heartbroken for retail investors who, who lost money to these people. And, and um, I also, you know, feel very heartbroken for, you know, an incredibly resilient team. I mean, you know, the uh, people at Affinity Foundation have been working away for years and years and years. Um, and they derive strength from the incredible technology that they produce um, every day. And they understand that in the end, you know, world computer will change the world. And we're chasing this thing, blockchain singularity, where every system and service is rebuilt on blockchain. Um, but these are like, in many cases, like, you know, world famous cryptographers and engineers and researchers and things like that. And, you know, they've actually been s saddled with this horrible lie um, where we were framed, we were framed as the bad guys. Like we were framed as doing a, running a pump and dump. Um, it's always the good guys were framed as the bad yeah, guys, right? Did you see that in politics every single time? It's so perverse, you know, and it's so, I, it's so absolutely perverse. Um, it, it, you couldn't make it up. One day there'll be a film about it, but I mean, forget the big short, forget 2008, forget Theranos. Like this is on a scale that is unimaginably larger. And I think um, we, we've got to fix this. I, I think what, what I hope is that regulators come in and first of all, deal with um, centralized finance where it intersects with crypto because that's where most of the obvious problems occur, but also then go on to look at these, um, you know, manipulation of social media, unfair, misleading, false advertising and things like that. I mean, even listings, we, we at OKCoin and OKX, that, you know, which is part of the OK group, like on both exchanges, there is no listing fees because we truly try to list what we believe in, what we believe people want to, you know, what people want. And especially on the OKCoin side, we're a licensed exchange. We try to do the best due diligence we can. Um, but, you know, we'll see other exchanges, not to name any, but they'll just charge a listing fees. And if you pay the listing fees, they'll list you, they'll list you first, they'll, you know, they'll publish so much content about your token that people think it's the next big thing versus, you know, it was just a paid listing. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing for our own products, by the way, same, just really a quick plug. We don't, our earn is a UX for DeFi. We, whatever rates we get in Anchor or Compound, we pass on to our customers, right? So there's no money management. We just take the money make it easy for people to deposit to DeFi and take, make it easy for them to withdraw from But that's from not DeFi. standard, to your point. It's not standard at all. Yeah. No one, almost no one does that. I'm glad to hear it. We're in the situation we're in now. I mean, crazy stuff was going on. I mean, Alameda Research was the, the most sort of um, ruthless um, pro trading shop. And, you know, they were co-located with FTX. And I think, you know, 
retail investors were unaware that, you know, they were putting in things like stop losses and the folks over at Alameda could see their stop losses and could manipulate the market to, to, to profit themselves. And, you know, that kind of thing has got to be fixed, it really has, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what I, I will say for you know probably both me and Alex, um, but definitely for me, I think everything that you said really resonated with why I joined the crypto industry in the first place. Alex and I were both at you know Microsoft before before we joined crypto, and you know we were the global corporate strategy team, and we saw pretty early the value that blockchain brings. Um, and I think it's also because we both came in from the blockchain side rather than the crypto side. Um, and Alex, especially, you know, really is Mr. Mr. Ibida. He really believes in he really believes in the blockchain technology and the power to transform people, people and their lives. Um, so I think it, you know, what you said really resonated. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that there is a way to amplify the message of the Definity Foundation and what the Internet Computer does, um, and to really show people or at least give them the access to information so they can decide, um, as devs or as retail investors, if it's something that they want to engage with. Absolutely. I mean, look, the, the future of crypto is bright, but we're going to go through some pretty naughty times now because regulators are going to use it as an excuse to come in and try and break on as crypto. And, um, but look, you know, I mean, um, I, I'll make some predictions. I think, you know, in a few years time, um, the majority of startups worldwide will actually be DAOs rather than corporations um, because you get rid of the bureaucratic overhead. It's much easier to um, uh, you know, create international and run international teams. You're not rooted in some jurisdiction. You've got a kind of uh, a digital democracy based on algorithms running in cypherspace. And, um, you know, the, the, there are going to be ways of raising money, not for yourself in an ICO, but for, 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 the, for the community of developers um, building whatever the DAO governs. So, I, you know, that's incredibly impactful. Like, a DAO is, uh, you know, really a replacement for governmental frameworks for organization like um, companies and foundations, and partnerships and trusts and funds, all that kind of stuff. So that's just, but that's just one piece of the story. I mean, I think what you're going to see is um, blockchain democratizing access to the tech economy. And you're going to see all these amazing projects springing up in places like China and India, particularly, um, just bringing a tidal wave of new talent in that's going to build, build out Web3. Uh, I think that you know, the technology is going to transform what an online service is. Like, you know, web, web one was read. We just like pulled content off web servers into our browsers. Um, web two started really kicked off like 1996, 1997 with hot or not and things like that, where users are actually uploading media for other users to look at. Right. And web three is, is really about ownership and ownership's much more. I mean, NFTs are great, by the way, but you know, ownership is much more profound than NFTs. It's about you know, users actually controlling um, online service, the online services they participate in and, and use and actually becoming part of the team in many cases. Um, and that will drive all kinds of really, you know, profound changes over the next 10, 10 20 years. But, you know, it, it's going to happen. I, I just think this kind of off-road um, will, will, will delay things. Um, but, but I think... I don't think it'll delay things as much as people think. It's just going to make it even more gnarly than it was going to be already. So it's going to be a bumpy ride, but I, 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 we're going to get there in the end. Like you can't stop technology, right? Technology, you yeah. know, um, when technology provides a better way forward, people people adopt it and use it inevitably. So, and you can see it now. I mean, I tweeted this just earlier. Actually, if you look at the cycles being consumed on the internet computer, which reflect the actual amount of computation going on there, amount of smart contract computation going on, um, it's just going up and up. I, I forget what it is. It's not like four, five x from the beginning of the year, and it, and and, and it, it's sort of flatlined. It flattened out a bit as the crypto winter first started taking hold, and now it's going up again, even more rapidly than before. Um, you can't hold real world technology utility back. People want it. Um, so we, we, you know we, we're gonna you know, we're gonna get where we want to go eventually. I just think that you know we have to sort of um, fix a lot of these industry issues. I think maybe, and that's why I think you know it, it's a good thing. What's happened is good, albeit what's not good is all those people who wanted to back this brighter future, who saw their um, funds disappear into the kind of corrupt system that was created. Well, look, 
Dom, this has been an incredible conversation. Thank you so much for coming uh, coming on. Pleasure. I, I really do hope that our, our yeah, thank you. I really hope do hope that our viewers one learn more about ICP uh, and Definity, but two well understand the differences, right? I think what you said in the beginning was very key AWS versus not what's actually blockchain, what's not, you know, the fact that for example Solana every time there's an issue not to hit on them uh, or pick on them, but they turn off the chain and then restart the chain. You know, those are serious kind of red flags right there, right? It, this is not, blockchain isn't something you just turn off and restart and power cycle. So just on um, that front, I mean, for, for listeners, I mean, I, this is shocking, but I, I would say that in excess of 95% of blockchains um, aren't blockchains at all. They're really just token distributed token databases um, that yeah, yeah. have been created to enable someone to sell you their tokens. And that's a hard thing to, to swallow, but it's the truth. Yeah, no, I think I think this is very important. This is right. And look, where there's, I, you know, there are probably 20,000 tokens out there. And I don't know, 19,500 are probably complete garbage, right? And so then you have to find the ones. And then there's creative uh, destruction and creative uh, uh, construction, if you will, of, of, of people trying different things. but. The vast majority are are trying. Right, one thing I said, yeah, one of our HLs. They are. Look, one bit of guidance I give to people um, is, if you really want to eva evaluate a blockchain project, there's there's a, the, the, there's a kind of simple test, and that is dig into the teams behind them. You know, um, dig into the teams. It's very difficult to fake. Some some projects do. Some projects list a lot of I won't say which, but you know, an awful lot of. Um, researchers like who work at universities like PhDs and um, up in the, you know and, and actually in actual fact they're just paying their research grant to get their company name on their papers you know you need to dig in to um, the full-time employees look at the composition of the team is it like 90% business development and marketing folks or is it like 90% engineers and you know Remember that, you know, advanced blockchain is 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 no place for, um, <coughs> you know, it's no place. You 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 know, just a, t a team of your, your of hackers can't can't make progress in this space. And the reason is that it involves a lot of com advanced computer science, like cryptography. Um, anyone can understand, you know, what a digital signature signature scheme is, scheme is right, but. When you need to actually um, develop like advanced blockchain protocols at scale and, and run faster and all this kind of stuff, um, you inevitably uh, need to develop novel cryptography, and that's actually very very difficult to do. And you know, um, most um, proven cryptographers have been working in the field for, for, for more than ten years. Um, it, it's non it's non trivial. You need to be very good at math. You need to actually have a specific training in cryptography. You need to create a PhD in cryptography or be a professor in cryptography. And, then moved into to, to blockchain. Um, you know, look for engineers from you know traditional backgrounds like Google Research. You know, um, who've got proven um, you know track track histories. Um, you know, managing you know large scale engineering efforts um, or working on very complex technology like execution environments. Like you know, you, you, actually the teams will give you the best guide as to the actual uh, truthiness of these blockchains claims because any it's cheap right anyone can say oh this is an internet scale blockchain um how are you going to evaluate it like how do you how are you possibly you know um the only way you can really know is is by um well one of the best ways you can find out is is by digging into the teams behind them because for example if someone's like an internet scale blockchain and you're like team comprising you know um no cryptographers and so on and it's really very suspicious, um, and that that that's actually how VCs um, used to for Web three, right? That's that's how they used to evaluate startups. They dig into the teams, and and that's by far the best uh, signal you can get. Um, but but you know um, you've got to stay away from. To some extent, you can't expect the crypto media. Most of the journalists involved don't even know how the system works themselves. You can't expect to get a signal from that. You definitely can't expect to get much signal from social media because it's been so corrupted by bot farms and water armors and things like that. Um, but if you dig into the teams, 
and look at the backgrounds yep. of the individuals involved, that will tell you an enormous amount. Um, and I think if we can get people focused on that kind of thing, um, we're going to have far fewer cases where people just invest in kind of shit coins and, and get scammed. I think, yeah, this is fantastic advice, and especially for retail to save people from investing in shit coins. Uh, you're, you know, you're right. Look at the teams. We look at GitHub uh, code drops. We look at actual activity to see, you know, if, if people are actually building and developing and um, or not, or is it all just hype and people aren't docs. Well, look, uh, Dom, thank you so much for coming. Real pleasure uh, for having you uh, on the show. Um, and everyone check out Internet Computer and uh, Infinity. Thank you so much. Please do. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.